Anyone else watching that we're not aware of? God bless you too. Psalm 91. It says here in verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust his truth, and shall be thy shield and buckler. <clears throat> okay? Now you get people, and this is true, and I, I brought this out a few months ago when I told you about Bill Johnson, okay, uh, who has the Bethel, I think it's Bethel Church. He said that he... And I heard him say this. I, I watched the video of him teaching this. That he used to believe that God didn't have feathers, but now believes that God has feathers because of this verse. That's letterism. That's taking it to the extreme and, and, and pushing a meaning into it that is not. He took it literal, literally, and, and it's called letterism, where he says that God has feathers. God's not a chicken. He's not a bird. He doesn't have wings or feathers. He's a spirit. When, when uh, Jesus uh, rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples and Doubting Thomas was there and he said, uh, you know, put your hand in my, I won't believe unless I put my finger into your side. And, and what, did, what did Jesus say to him? He said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones such as you see me have. He thought it was, it was a ghost. He thought it was a spirit. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. So you say, but, well, pastor, how come the Bible says that the eye of the Lord is upon them and he has a hand and, and his feet and it's, it talks about, you know, his backside when Moses saw his backside. And what about all those expressions? Surely he has a form. No. He's a spirit. If I, if I, you know, and you see the scripture that says, well, the, land, the Lord's hand is not shortened, nor his arm heavy. So see, he's got an arm, he's got a hand. So letterism says that that is literal, and that's not literal. Okay, that's a, a way of communication to you and I so that we understand. Okay. What does a hand do? Holds things, produces, okay? So God will let us understand the eyes of the Lord are upon them to let you know that he, he knows everything. He sees everything. His ears are not heavy. He hears everything. But he doesn't have a literal ear. If, if God fills, well, I shouldn't say that, because God fills all of the universe, Right? He's everywhere present, omnipresent. So if he's everywhere present, then how big is his ear? If he's everywhere present, how big is his hand? We would be able to see probably one little dot of the line in his hand, if, if that. Because he fills all the heavens and all the earth. He's immense and filling every aspect of, of what we know of the universe and beyond. Because we're, we're limited in knowledge. We don't know. So if he fills all of that, then the, le the, the letterism is thinking that God has a hand and a foot and an eye. That's what's called the anthropomorphic expression of God so that we can understand that he's a personal God, that he's not a God afar off. Yeah, but how are we going to understand who God is? Well, that's, what he, that's why he became a man. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. Because he was God in human flesh. Come on, somebody. Okay, so we saw how he lived, how he talked. We saw what he taught. We heard what he taught. 
We've seen God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because they said, show us the Father. He says, how long am I going to be with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I am, ex I am exampling the Father's character. He wasn't saying that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, that God was, was a body. Because there is some teaching that's out there. Um, and it's erroneous because they say, well, God has a spirit, soul, and body. Jesus has a spirit, soul, and body. And the Holy Spirit has a spirit, soul, and body. <clears throat> that's lateralism again. Okay. No. Eight, uh, John 8, 12. Another example where, uh, especially the metaphysical cults, and those that are, <clears throat> excuse me, those that are uh, of the Christian science and New Age. And you heard Oprah Winfrey talk about God is the light. He's a bright light. Then Jesus spoke again unto them, saying what? I am the light of the world. Does that mean that Jesus is a light bulb? You know, it sounds foolish, but there are people that really believe that. They interpret it that way. Wherever you go, if you see light in a room, that's Jesus. No. What did he mean when he said, I am the light of the world? He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Well, who's walking in darkness? We're always turning lights on. We're, we got our car. We drive with our lights on. How, how are we walking in darkness? Spiritually. Jesus is not a light bulb. He is the light. In other words, he exposes everything and brings everything to our consciousness, our, our life. In other words, things that are hidden, sins that we've committed, he brings to light, makes it known. I can say it better that way. Makes it known to us. Before you were born again, you didn't know God. You know about God. You know certain factual information about God, but you didn't have an intimate relationship with him. You didn't know him. Right? There was something missing in you. But when you became born again, and that dead spirit that was inside of you became alive again, and you were reconnected back to God, then you came to understand as you begin to read the word of God that God loved you, that he cares about you, that he has a plan for you, and that he, he wants to heal you and deliver you. He wants to... Uh, provide for you. And so when you, when, you, when you come to that realization, that's light. First Corinthians 10.4 <clears throat> And did all drink of the same spiritual drink. Remember we're talking about Moses in the desert. But they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Ha! Jesus is a rock. So we got him as a, a light bulb. We got him as bread. Now we got him as a rock. And what happens is, you get into, the, you get into metaphysical realm, then you get what's called pantheism. How many ever heard of pantheism? God is in everything. You know, people say to me, you know, especially with the marijuana craze that's going on now, you know, what's so wrong with marijuana? God created it. Didn't God create it? Well, God created everything, so he created marijuana. So what's wrong with it? 
Well, I said, if you feel that way about it, God created poison ivory, but I don't see you rolling around in it. Isn't that the truth? All right, well. John 8, 1 to 11. John 8. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And when I read stuff like that, you have to understand, when you've been to the Mount of Olives, it just clicks in you. You say, man, I was there. I was on the Mount of Olives. In the same area that he walked. Maybe not the same ground, but the same area. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Verse 2. I'm going to go right to verse 11. And early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Think about that. In the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Okay, hold it right there. What did they just do? Letterism. They were so adamant about the, the letter of the law When that's not what it was that's not what it was intended for. What about God's mercy? What about God's grace? Okay, now you're going to see why. Next verse. What do you say, Jesus? And this they said, tempting him that they may have to accuse him. They wanted Jesus to misinterpret the word. They wanted Jesus to give a meaning to the scriptures that they, other than the meaning that they came up with. They wanted to trap him. But Jesus just simply stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Wonder what he was writing. Some people have surmised some things that he was writing. Nobody knows because nobody was there. But sometimes people speculate and you can speculate too. Let's go on to the next verse. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he brought it home to them. Next verse. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, And when the, and they which heard it, being convicted of their own conscience. Now some people, some commentaries say as he was writing, he was writing different women's names down. That Some that were standing there ready to stone were the ones that. But we don't know that for a fact. But that wouldn't surprise me if he did that. Because he knew all things. Remember the woman at the well, he says, yeah, you've had five husbands. And the one you're with, you, didn't, you haven't married yet. So he knows he's God. And one by one they went out, beginning with the elders, even until the last. Jesus was left alone with a woman standing in the midst. And of course, you know the rest of the story. He said to the woman, Woman, where are those that where are they that condemn thee? And she said, None, Lord. And he said, Go thy way, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. How did he get out of that? Because the Bible does talk about those that are caught in adultery should be stoned. See, that's why people fight over Scripture. Because they say, see, the Ten Commandments says, honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday. That's the Jewish Sabbath. We need to honor the Jewish Sabbath. We need to keep the Jewish feast. And they all get into Jewish garb, and they put on the, the yarmulke, and they put on the shawls, and they all march around like they're Jews. 
because they take that to the extreme. Now, I don't have any problem someone came in here wearing a yarmulke and a shawl, and that's how they want to worship God. That's, I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is when they say that we must all do the same thing. Now, we ran into a situation, I won't mention any churches or any people, okay? But they, we ran into some people in our ministry, and they told us, unless you wear that shawl, God doesn't hear your prayers. So again, be careful. Amen? Now, here's a real tough one. That letterism, like I said, is pushed to the nth degree to mean something that it doesn't mean. John 6, starting with verse 53. You getting something out of this? I hope so. John 6, starting with verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Think about that. Man. Okay, who wants a finger? I mean, how would you do that? Jesus said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So what happens is, going back to that chart, you don't have to go, go back to it, but if you remember, the first one I said is that they spiritualize, their, they, you know, they spiritualize it and they allegorize it. Well, then you know what that means? That we have to somehow transform it. So what we'll do is we'll have a service with the, with the, uh, with the bread or the Eucharist, if you want, whatever it is, and we'll lift it up to God and we'll say these certain things and we'll call down and then we'll trans, trans substantiate that thing and that thing will no longer be bread. It will become the body of Jesus Christ and we'll eat it. That's why you could not chew it. Remember when you were a kid? You were told in catechism, don't chew it. But I used to lick it because it got stuck to the top of the roof of my mouth. How many ever did that? Come on, be honest. Right? You got stuck on the top of the roof of your mouth and Okay. I'll never forget the time. <laughs> I think I told you the story before. We went to a funeral, Linda and I, cousin. Um, went to a funeral, and um, of course, you know, at a funeral, they have communion. Catholic Church, they have communion. True story. <clears throat> so we're sitting in the second or third row, Linda and I, and we're with cousins, and time for communion, and this mother's dragging her kid up there. He's about seven, I guess, six or seven. She's dragging him, come on, come on, come on. You could tell he was never in church. You know, you could tell he was unchurched. <clears throat> now, you have to understand that in the ritualism of Catholicism, it's a very solemn moment. It's very quiet. I think the organist is playing those big pipe organs in the background quietly, you know, singing. <laughs> whatever they do, you know. And so she's dragging this little kid up there. And so he gets up there, and the priest has the Eucharist, you know, and he takes it. And before, they used to put it in your mouth. But I guess because of sanitary, you know, things, they don't do that anymore. They give it to you. So this little kid, who had never probably been in church before in his life, he took the wafer, he looked at it, and he stuck it in his pocket. And he walked away. You could see the indignation on the priest's face. And the mother grabbed him by the hand. 
And the little kid's like, what, 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 what? <clears throat> but you understand the bondage that puts a person in. And of course, they had that big plate, so if they dropped it, they wouldn't drop Jesus on the floor. Okay, and I'm not making fun of Catholicism. I'm just, that's the way it is. Okay, I grew up being a Catholic, you know, and I know that's the way it is. That's what they do, and I'm not ridiculing that, but it's crazy because of this verse taken out of context. Go to the next verse. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. <clears throat> so how can we prove? What's the one thing we can prove that this is not literal? I'm going to ask you that question. How can we prove this scripture is not talking about literally eating his flesh or drinking his blood? How can we prove it? <clears throat> Someone here has got to have the answer. How can we prove it? What are you saying? No venus? I, I hear somebody... <laughs> Speak it out. Yes, Sister Lucy. Yes. How can we prove this scripture is not talking about eating his literal flesh and drinking his literal blood? How can we prove it? Hmm? Okay, communion, that's how the Catholics got transubstantiation, that they have to have an authority to be able to transform it, because Jesus took it and transformed it, literally into his blood and his, his bread. That's not the answer I'm looking for, though. How can we prove that eating his flesh and drinking his blood wasn't meant literally to obtain eternal life? Bobby. Okay, that's good, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. You want the answer? Okay, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is this. If eating his flesh and drinking his blood was to obtain eternal life, then you and I today could never be saved. Because he's not here. So God would not love, so love the world... He would only love the generation that was alive during the time of Jesus' life on earth that could eat his flesh and drink his blood. You and I would not be able to get saved. If eternal life came from literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood, then we couldn't be saved because he's not here. You follow me? Some of you are looking kind of... No, it's just a fact. It's just a fact. If, if eating his flesh and drinking his blood was the way to eternal life, literally, then you and I could not be saved because we don't have Jesus here to eat his flesh and blood, drink his blood, literally. So let's see what he was talking about. He says, and I will raise him up the last day. Next verse. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Hmm. Next verse. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Okay, keep going. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your father did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Are you kidding me? Is he talking about cannibalism? 
That's what it sounds like. But see, letterism will take it to the furthest extent and really push that meaning into it. He's talking about cannibalism. No, he's not. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. We were in Capernaum. We were in that temple, right, hon? And where the seat would have been in the temple, there's still the remains of some of the old temple. We were in that temple. Can you imagine... He says, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. First of all, they, they couldn't drink blood. It was against the law. See, that's how you begin to understand. By getting this word in you and getting the word you know, that you're looking at and examining it with other scripture and say, it couldn't be literal because it talks about the partaking of blood. We're not, not supposed to do that. Okay. So many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. How can we understand it? How can we hear it? Maybe some of you thought the same thing when you first read that scripture years ago or maybe months ago, whenever you did read that. How can, this, how can I do that? How is that possible? But then Jesus gives the clarification. That's why I tell you all the time, and I'll beat it into you if I have to, okay? Context, context, context. Always take it in context. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Does that offend you? Why did he ask him that? Because they were offended. They couldn't understand. They were, they were trying to understand something that was spiritual in the natural. They were trying to figure it out in their own reason. Let me say this about reason. You can reason the true meaning of Scripture away. What do you mean, Pastor? And I'll get back to this other thing. You open up your Bible and you read that an axe head floated. An axe head is metal. And it floated. And if you put reason into it, you would say, reasonably, when you throw something heavier into something that is not able to sustain that weight, it's going to sink. This is where a lot of the letterists are the higher critics of Scripture because they interpret Scripture through reason only. Say, that story cannot be true. So they cast doubt on the Scripture because their reasoning faculties say an axe head cannot float. That's how they, they come up with their reasoning. They, their reasoning actually becomes the interpreter rather than the word of God interpreting their reasoning. Hello? You have to let the word of God. <clears throat> God's word says that an ax had floated. And now another one, now I'll give you another example, is where they say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. <laughs> he would have been dead going down to the depths of the sea like that. How could he have survived? Impossible. Reason. Not possible. Peter, walk on water? That's, that goes against the very laws of gravity that God created. God created gravity. Okay, what goes up must come down. How can you walk on a, on a substance that's fluid? You walk, go right through it. Impossible. Didn't happen. Well, just think for a moment. The law of aerodynamics. You and I can say, hey, I can fly. 
and jump off a cliff, what's going to happen? <whistles> right? But if I have a greater law than the law of, of aerodynamics, like a jet engine that can propel me, and wings that are aerodynamically designed to lift me up. Now, we have airplanes. And we think nothing of it, of taking our little luggage bags and going in there, right? And putting them in the, in the, in the compartment down there. And, and we go in there, and we sit there, and we buckle up. And this little tin can... Okay, with 300 people or 200 people or whatever, how many people are in it, all of a sudden rides along this little road, goes there, and all of a sudden the thrusters come forward and that jet engine roars, and what happens? That plane begins to defy gravity because it's a greater law than gravity. It's overtaking that, that law. So what happens? You're airborne. Doesn't it amaze, I mean, am I crazy? When I sit in a plane and I'm going from one place to another, it amazes me. I'm saying, here I am in this little tin can, flying at 500 miles an hour. Think about it. You're in a car going 80 miles an hour, 90, that's fast. Okay? But think about it. You're in this little thing okay, with all these strangers going like 500-something miles an hour. And within a matter of hours, you're from one coast to the other. And you get out and you want like seven, six hours, seven hours, whatever it is. You're in Massachusetts. And then six hours later, you're in California. And you get off the plane, you're, you're in California. But see, reason is not to be trusted if it nullifies the word of God. If God said it, I believe it. That's it. If God said that there was an axe head that floated, I, I don't have to examine it and say, well, let's see the, the uh, elements of design and how that could possibly be through science. I don't have to do that. I believe God wouldn't lie. I believe God can't lie. He's holy. So if God can't lie because he's holy, then what he said in his word, I believe it. He said, does this offend you, what I told you? Next verse. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Put that back. The scripture before. Yeah. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. What? Ascend up? To where you were before? What in the world are you talking about? You were born. Of the Virgin Mary. You're a human being. What are you talking about? Where you were before. Where was he before? Huh? He was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. All things were created by Him, and all things that were made were created by Him, and there was nothing made that was not made without Him, Jesus, the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only glory of the Son of God. Hallelujah. And what if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Would that make you believe? 
Next verse. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words, here's the interpretation. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. I'm not talking literally of eating my flesh. I'm not talking about literally eating and drinking my blood. The words that I'm speaking to you, they are spirit. Eating is a partaking. Drinking is a partaking. If you eat of the sacrifice of my body on that cross for your sins, and you drink of the blood of of, of sacrifice for forgiveness. You have eternal life. That's the meaning of it. That's the meaning of it. It's spiritual. It's not literal. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Next verse. But there be some of you that believe not. But Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So many people, so many people misinterpret Scripture. That's why you have to know the literal interpretation we talked about, the grammatical, historical interpretation versus the allegorical. The allegorical sometimes can take you way, way out. And there's no real judge of that allegorical method. See, like, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. In the Old Testament, when it talks about Israel, many, many authors and many, many people, very famous people too, very famous Christians, where it says Israel, they put the word church. And my question to them is this. What gives you the right our permission to change the literal interpretation of Israel to the church. Who gave you that permission? And usually, when you see that happening, it's because people are into covenant theology, and they are also into what's called replacement theology, where the church has replaced Israel. And when you see that, that is a bona fide lie from the very pit of hell. The church has not replaced Israel. God has not forgotten his, his people. They are his chosen people. And I don't care what anybody says or anybody comes along and says, God says in the book of Romans, chapter 9, 10, and 11, that he is able to graft them in again. God is not forgiven. He said, if he spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he not spare you also, meaning the Gentiles. Can I get an amen somewhere? Next verse. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he said, therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. How about that? Now, you got Oprah Winfrey saying, you, there are many paths to what you would call God. That's a direct quote from her. And if her God is light, and it brings her to the same path to God, what difference does it make? Well, the difference that it makes is that if that's true, then it makes Jesus a liar. If that makes Jesus a liar, then that means he's a sinner. And if he's a sinner, he's no longer qualified to be a savior. You see how you bring that to its conclusion? Therefore said I unto you that no man cometh unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man goes to the Father except through me. Um, I think it's Brian Houston, who is the church, uh, pastor of uh, um, the church in Australia, Hillsong, was talking with Oprah Winfrey. <clears throat> and he said, uh, and she asked him a question. Can you, can you have a relationship with God without going through Jesus Christ? And he said, yes. See, this, this is what I'm saying to you is that there are people that are handle, mishandling the Word of God. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? It's profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction, right? And that the man of God may be fully furnished, rightly dividing or interpreting the Word of truth. If you, wanna, if you really want to understand the Scriptures, then you need to get, the, you need to get the, um, the tools to do that. And that's what we're trying to provide with you, for you here is just because you read it in the Bible or in a commentary, don't believe it. Research it for yourself. Don't be a parrot. Don't be a parrot Christian. You know what a parrot Christian is? They read something. And bark, 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 bark. They don't study it. They don't research it. They, bark, 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 bark. they just repeat it. No, study it so that you know for yourself. Study to show thyself approved. Because before you know it, sometimes you're buck, 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 and you're teaching false teaching. Look what he says here. Next verse. From that time, Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's sad. Many of his disciples went back and walked with, no more with him. Why? Because they were offended. They couldn't get over what he was saying. They couldn't understand. So that tells me that the natural man cannot understand the things which are spiritual, for he is spiritually discerned, neither can he know them. That's in 1 Corinthians. The Bible tells us very plainly that the unsaved don't understand the Bible. I've had many people that were unsaved come to me and said, you know, I tried reading the Bible, I don't understand it. Okay, that's like putting dead flashlight batteries in a flashlight and expecting it to work. It's never going to work if you've got dead batteries. But see, you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and therefore, before you were saved, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead? You were dead? Were you, you were dead. Spiritually speaking, you were separated from God. That's what death is. It's a separation. You were separated from God. You didn't have a connection with him. You had a religion toward him. You prayed and talked to him. But you prayed not according to the word. You prayed ritualistic prayers. Why? But now, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins have been made alive. Are you hearing me? You've been made alive. Why have you been made alive? Because your old man was crucified with him. And when you come into the realization and relationship of that, what took place on that cross, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passing away and all things become new. He gives you a new nature. His nature. So you can walk in newness of life, not in the oldness of the letter of the law of the flesh. Not trying to appease God by being good. Although you're good now because you love, you love Jesus, not to get his approval. You want to be good. We talked about that in Romans chapter 7. 
From that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked <clears throat> no more with him because they were offended. They took the letterism of the words that were spoken and they put a meaning into it that didn't mean. There was some walking around, probably even gossiping and talking. Do you know that? We, we were followers of Jesus, but you know what? We gave up on him. We just walked away because he wanted us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. He was talking about cannibalism. You know that sometimes when you tell people the truth, they walk away with the same ideology that they had before they came to you. How many have ever witnessed the uncles, cousins, aunties, brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, whatever, right? And they, they talk about the Bible. They know a little bit about the Bible. They, they, they can't know everything about the Bible. They can't know spiritual truth because if they knew spiritual truth, they would receive him as their Savior. They'd be born again. You ask them, are you born again? Have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Oh, I, have, I know Jesus, but uh, well, so when you die, uh, you know, well, how are you going to get into heaven? Well, God's going to weigh out my good and my bad. When they say that, you know they don't know Jesus. If Peter was to say to you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Huh? Because I'm born again and I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior and he's my justification, my righteousness, my holiness, my... He's everything. So I come in through the blood of Jesus, not my works. Not, my works are like filthy rags. So interpreting the Bible, don't get caught up in letter, letterism. L-E-T-T-E-R-I-S-M. Letterism. Where you actually push it to the extent and say, see, Jesus has a hand, you know, the, that uh, God has a hand and a foot. He has feathers and wings. But see, but the thing about it is, is that so many people are deceived. And this kind of teaching, sound doctrinal teaching, they laugh at that. They don't want that. They want the metaphysical, they want the spiritual ooh, typology. They want to make the word say something that it doesn't so that they can sell more CDs. So they can send you a package. How to be rich. A formula to be rich. So a thousand dollars and God will bless you. No, God says, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you'll not lose your reward. See, again, make sure when you're interpreting the word, literal interpretation, historical interpretation. What was the, what was the author of the letter speaking? Who was he speaking to? What was the climate condition? What was going on at the time? Why did he say that to him? Why was he writing that to them? Why did Jesus say that? Many walked, after that, many walked away. Why did he say, tell them, eat my flesh and drink my blood? Why did he do that? He was filtering out those who truly believed and those who truly went. In fact, if you go on and read this scripture, go, go to the next one. I'm going to close in a minute. Go to the next scripture. 67. Then... Jesus said to the twelve, will you go also? Wow. So we know the twelve didn't go, but all the rest of them went. So Jesus comes along and says, okay, are you going to go too? Are you going to leave me? Next verse. Then Simon Peter, big mouth Peter, sanguine Peter, open, open mouth insert foot Peter, says to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Is there another verse to that? Go to the next one. 
And we believe, look at this, we believe and are sure. Not only do we believe, but we're sure that thou art that Christ. Now, is Christ Jesus' last name? Some people believe that. What does Christ mean? Huh? What does Christ mean? You don't know what Christ means? Wow. Yes. You cheated. <laughs> cheater, cheater, cheater. Everybody look, camera go over there. Look, cheater. Christ means anointed one or Messiah. Okay, there's a very famous preacher on TV that, uh, that wrote a book and said that Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They said, we believe and assure that thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. He's not a dead God. He's a living God. You know, we used to sing this song years ago. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Yeah. He's in you. He's in me. Praise God. Any questions? Did, you, did this help you tonight? To understand a little bit better? Just be careful out there because there's a lot of kooks. When you turn that TV on, there's a lot of kooks out there. A lot of people. And they're very successful, have big churches. Yes? I believe so, somewhere, yeah. Yeah, they have power. You know, some, some, some of them died too, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think down south, more down south than anywhere else. The snake handlers. Yeah, because the Bible says, and that's a good example. I'll give you an example. But the Bible says, if you pick up any deadly serpent or anything like that, it shall not harm you. So they go and they literally pick up rattlesnakes. Some have been bitten and some have died. Okay. So again, again, that's not talking literal. That's talking spiritual. How many know that Satan is not a snake? So people see a snake, oh, Satan, no. Oh. No, he's not a snake. He's an angel. He's a created being. But he used the snake as an instrument to talk to Eve. But the snake is not the devil. What? Yep, that was Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson. Okay, here's the thing. Okay. Well, actually, <coughs> actually, that also happened in a restaurant. They were just sitting around, and all of a sudden, these feathers started coming and falling down. It's demonic. Uh, 